this second video in a two-part series, we're exploring how scientists measure processes C and S. As a reminder, process C is a circadian rhythm in alertness, or its opposite, sleepiness, and process S is a homeostatic or sleep pressure system. And together, they help determine when you're alert and when you sleep. Before watching this video, if you have not watched both the two process model of sleep by the BioClock Studio, as well as the first video in the series, Exploring Processes C and S, Part 1, Napping Protocol, we recommend you do so. Now that we learned about Process C in the previous video, we can look more into the interaction between Process C and Process S by exploring a paper from Dr. Gregory Roch's lab. The title of the paper is Sleep, Wake, and Face Dependent Changes in Neurobehavioral Function Under Forced Desynchrony. Instead of the very short napping protocol that Dr. Labi used to isolate process C, Dr. Roche's team took a different approach in this study and used a very long day. The schedule in his study required the participants to be on a 28-hour day. This protocol allows the researchers to examine both process C and process S by analyzing the data in different ways. In every 28-hour day, there was a 9.33 hour sleep opportunity in bed in darkness, followed by 18.67 hours out of bed in dim light. And this was repeated for seven cycles. So in this protocol, participants could sleep for 9.33 hours in every 28 hour day, which is equivalent to about eight hours in every 24 hours, enough that sleep pressure or process S is not accumulating much across the study period. But 28 hour is too long of a day for the human circadian clock to entrain to. So circadian rhythms, such as body temperature and alertness, and potentially process C driving sleep, will free run in these conditions. That means the rhythms of the participants will all stay on the internal endogenous schedule that humans have, which is slightly longer than 24 hours, but much shorter than the imposed 28 hour day. This kind of study design is called a forced desynchrony protocol because the clock cannot sync with the environment, and it has been used by a number of different research labs because it is one of the only ways to isolate effects of process C and process S in humans. Because the participants are free running, the opportunity to sleep in a 28 hour day falls at all different times of their internal circadian clock across the study period. This way, the researchers can look separately at the effect of the circadian phase of participants, process C, in the prior wake or length of the time the participant was awake building sleep pressure, process S. They can also look at the interaction between the two processes as well. While researchers can measure the effect of this type of protocol on many variables, in this study, they looked at performance on a cognitive task. They used the PBT, or psychomotor vigilance task, where participants are asked to respond to a stimulus as quickly as possible. The test was done when participants first entered the lab before the protocol began, creating a baseline performance level for each participant, and then multiple times within the awake period of each long 28-hour day to see if there was a difference in accuracy and response time at different circadian phases, process C, as well as to see how performance was affected by the amount of time spent awake, process S. Dr. Roche's team also looked at whether sleep restriction or shorter sleep could affect the performance of the participants. In this way, they examined the effect of circadian phase, prior wake, and sleep restriction, all in the same study. So while the previous group could sleep for 9.33 hours in each 28-hour day, we'll call that the standard condition, a new second group of participants could only sleep for 4.67 hours in each 28-hour day, so half as much, and we'll call that the sleep-restricted condition. While the research team calculated and plotted quite a few different statistics from the PBT data, we will just be looking at the very slowest reaction times the participants had, so their worst reaction times out of each session, 
compared to their baseline scores from before the study began, both by the time awake, process S, and by circadian phase, process C. Here's a simplified representation of what the researchers found. In this graph, the x-axis is the number of hours participants have been awake. So for now, we are primarily examining the effects of the homeostat or process S. The y-axis is subject's performance on the PBT. Lower values on the y-axis represent worse performance on the PBT or slower reaction. And higher values represent better performance or faster reaction. The two separate lines represent the two sleep conditions. The dark blue line with dots is a standard condition where participants are allowed to sleep for 9.33 hours, and the purple line with squares is a sleep restricted conditions where they got half as much sleep in every 28 hour day. With these two variables, the researchers are trying to see if there is a relationship between the amount of time participants have been awake and what their reaction times are. As you can see, the line goes down as time passes. So, in general, performance declines the longer the participants stay awake for both groups. And performance is generally worse for the sleep-restricted group who got less sleep per 28-hour day. These are the effects that process S has on their cognitive performance. Now, in this other graph, the x-axis is the circadian phase of the participants when they're taking the PVT. So we are primarily examining the effects of process C. Remember, because of the 28-hour day protocol, they have now taken the PVT at all circadian phases. Some of the data in the last graph appear here also, just plotted differently. We can see that the researchers have plotted two days overall. The white bars underneath represent biological day, and the gray bar represents biological night. To define biological day and night, since it is not synced with the light-dark cycle, the researchers used each participant's body temperature minimum, which occurs late in subjective night, as a phase reference, represented here by the dotted line. On the y-axis, you can see this is the same measure we just looked at across time awake. So again, lower values on the y-axis represent worse, slower reactions. And higher values represent better, faster reactions. Again, the blue line with the dots is the standard conditions where participants are sleeping 9.33 hours, and the purple line with squares is the sleep restricted condition where they got half as much sleep in every 28 hour day. Now, just looking at the standard condition, this one, the researchers are trying to see if there is a relationship between the circadian phase of the participant and their performance. What you can see clearly is that reaction time is changing across the circadian phase. And this change is repeating. Now remember, participants are sleeping roughly 8 hours in every 24 hour day, and their sleep opportunity falls across all circadian phases during the whole protocol. Thus, by plotting performance versus circadian phase, this graph is reflecting the changes caused by process C. Now, looking more closely at the graph, there tends to be a peak near the end of biological day. And a dip near the end of biological night. For most of us, in our normal sleep-wake patterns outside of a lab, that would be peaking around 9 p.m. and dipping lowest at around 9 a.m. 
Now, looking at the sleep restricted condition in the lower purple line, we see that there is also a circadian fluctuation in performance. But in general, participants are even slower than their standard group because they got less sleep each day and also generally slower than their baseline scores as well. So the researchers were able to look at how performance in the PBT is affected by process S by measuring both prior wake and amount of sleep. And they also determine how performance in the PVT is affected by process C by measuring at different circadian times of day. In conclusion, forced dyschrony is an interesting and informative technique that circadian researchers use to measure process C and S in humans. By using tools like this one and the napping protocol we discussed in the previous video, researchers have been able to learn a great deal about the two processes C and S and how they affect us. Thank you for watching our video on the exploring processes C and S. Please check out our other videos regarding circadian biology on our BioCloak Studio channel.